And we're here with Connor Ryan, who's presented by our good friends over at HelloFresh. Connor, what is up? Evan, I'm doing well. How you doing? Doing great. Doing great. It has been quite a busy weekend for me, at least. Lots of prep hockey championships. There was girls and boys all weekend. So it was uh, quite a weekend of hockey. Lots of games, lots of time spent in the rink, but it was a very fun time. Very fun events. Uh, but we are back to talking Bruins, which is which is, again, all season been great. <laughs> I was thinking, like, is there anything negative we've talked about in the past couple months? The answer is no. And if you remember back to last summer, a lot of our episodes were somewhat negative. Cassidy's gone and the injury bug hitting the team and is Krejci coming back? Is Bergeron coming back? And now here we are in March and life's pretty good for the Bruins. Pretty damn good. 10 game win streak. Beat the Rangers Saturday in a matinee matchup. And the deadline acquisitions are already paying off. Dmitry Orlov, first star of the week, <laughs> his first week. You come to the Bruins, you're just immediately like, you're 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 like you're blessed when you come to the Bruins. You immediately uh, become a star, as Dmitry Orlov has has done three goals, nine points, four games. Um, we all knew he was going to be impactful, but to be this impactful this quickly, still kind of a surprise. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you look at just what he's he's brought and. Orlov's a guy that I think people, you know, you first found out the news that the Bruins got him. You're excited because I think people think he's a very physical defenseman, and he is. Like, he will he will knock guys over. He'll probably have a couple of highlight reel hits during the playoffs, but that's not necessarily, like, the foundation of his game. Like, he can do that, but um, I think where a lot of his value has been is kind of the stuff that doesn't register on the score sheet, right? Like, really good transition play, really good at killing plays down the other end of the ice, just – always seems to be in the right spot um, to, to negate plays and, and help you down the other end of the ice. So he's been as advertised in that regard, but offensively he's been unbelievable, right? Like whether it's the passing, um, how assertive he is with the puck and, and even just like the, the shot that he brings. I mean, he's got some really good power behind it and it's such, I think a, a different dynamic and something that this decor has been missing. Like there's no doubt this is a already very, very talented decor with guys like McAvoy and Lintom Grizzly, all these players that are really good at moving the puck, but having a guy that can just hammer the puck from any part of the ice um, has been a little bit of a missing component to this team. So adding that, whether it be at five and five or especially on the power play, I, I'd be curious if the Bruins power play is still kind of off and on over the next couple of weeks. And they want to, Tinker with a few things. I do wonder if a guy like Orlov gets a look on that top power play unit just because, you know, how good he is moving laterally, but just having that shot as something that uh, a a bunch of penalty killers have to be aware of. But uh, no, you're right. Like for how good he's been, it's been a surprise in terms of just the the tangible production. If he went through his his first five, six games and had two, three assists, was averaging 20 minutes a game, penalty kill, a little bit of power play. More than happy with what he would provide, but oh, you take add that on a second, the, yeah. But to add on just the tangible scoring and how assertive he is with the puck, and it's something where I think it also helps being a Jim Montgomery system in terms of how much he encourages the defenseman to push up the ice to uh, you know takes take some risk when the opportunity is there, and he's making the most of it. So when you add his skill set to this already very good team, I wouldn't say I'm surprised, but you can see how this uh, a very talented player like Orlov is going to thrive here right from the get go. And his first syllable in his last name is or. So just, you know, let Twitter. Seen that a go, lot already. Let Twitter go crazy um, on that one. But again, I just go back. I go back to, you know, obviously the production most likely is not going to be nine points every, you know, every four games. Most likely. You never know. This team is surprising everybody. Uh, but I probably wouldn't say that he's uh, on pace for that for the rest of the season. What I would say, though, is you may have found a full time D partner for Charlie McAvoy, which Grizzly is does a terrific job in that in that spot, right? The num- the advanced analytics for those two are through the roof. The chemistry is amazing. Like they can pin teams uh, in the in the offensive zone pretty well, keeping the puck in, moving the puck around, um, solid in their own end. Uh, great in transition play, obviously. But Orloff, a little more well rounded, um, I guess a little more physical than Grizzly, um, and maybe that's the route you take uh, in the playoffs. You know, Orloff has. Won a Stanley Cup, playoff pedigree, all those things, tough physical. He was the one who um, 
hit Kevin Miller up high a few years ago, if memory serves, right? Yes, that was Orlov. yes he was. Yeah. I was forgetting which which capital um, was doing those hits because there were so many. And uh, the Bruins now have two of those three. <laughs> but good for them. Um, but I, it is an interesting dynamic to think, hey, you know, maybe, you know, this obviously deepens the Bruins. And I think one thing that, you know, as the years have gone by, I think we've always waited for Matt Grizzlick's ascension into being a full-time top four defenseman. And while I do think he is a solid top four defenseman during the regular season, the postseason numbers aren't amazing. And I don't, and I think the Bruins, you know, just speaking off, you know, just kind of guessing here, want some more insurance there uh, than Grizzlick in the postseason. Um, and it is interesting to think maybe that is Charlie McAvoy's full-time partner now. Yeah, no, it's definitely, at the very least, Orlov's arrival gives the Bruins options, right? And yes. something that Jim Montgomery... Yeah has mentioned before in terms of Grizzly of, you know, knowing how good he is during the regular season, acknowledging what his postseason numbers are. Jim Montgomery, when he was asked about that, was pretty much like, well, I'm giving him a clean slate. You know, I'm a new coach. We'll see how the new system does, uh, you know, how he fares in that in the playoffs, uh, values what Grizzly brings. So I, just because I think Grizzly's been the odd man out two games since all have arrived doesn't mean that he's not going to be in the lineup for game one. But you're right. Whether that means that, Grizzly is then driving a, a third pairing next to a guy like Connor Clifton. You know, that's a good problem to have. If it is Grizzly on the outside looking in and it's forward and Clifton who both have played very well and, you know, serve, you know, key roles in terms of what they're good at. The Bruins will take that, right? There's not like really a weak link on this team. You can make the argument. There are no weak links because Matt Grizzly was probably a top four defenseman on 85, 90% of other decoys around the league. 100%, not, not yeah. All of them, right? <laughs> he so, was the top four defensive for this team for, yes, for a yes. bunch of so, months. So, so, again, and it's something where, again, those things also tend to, like, you know, solve themselves once you get to the playoffs, right? Like, let's say whatever the game one lineup is like Montgomery rolls with, um, I don't think it's necessarily an indictment on whichever player is the odd man out because, let's face it, if the Bruins are going to be playing into mid June, they're going to need all seven of those guys, if not even more guys. Like, you know, it's, it's the same with like over a long playoff run. I feel like every single player on that roster has one moment that stands out to you. Like AJ Greer might be the odd man out once, you know, if they get guys like Felino and, and Hall back. But I feel like AJ Greer is going to have a huge hit or a huge goal at some point during the playoffs, oh, right? When he gets yes. drawn to the lineup, right? So like Sean um, Thornton in game three of the uh, cup final in 2011. Yeah, that was just, exactly. The so. Every single player has to kind of pull on that rope once you get to the playoffs. So for the Bruins to be in the spot where, all right, I, I think it's, it's going to be a hot take, Evan. I think it's safe to assume that McAvoy, Lento, and Orlov are probably not going to get slotted out of the lineup. So you got three guys in there that I think are good. That I think are heat pretty That's good. a heat check. That's a heat I check. Ooh. I think they're pretty good. I wouldn't move them. I think you keep them in there. <laughs> throughout the playoff run, barring injury. So if you have the other uh, three spots and it's a guy like Fulbert, uh, Grizzly, Clifton, you know, Brennan Carlo, that's a great problem to have if you're the Bruins, right? And again, those things tend to always sort themselves out because all those guys are going to be taking a lot of punishment once we get to the playoffs. Especially a guy like Forbert, Clifton, those guys play, you know, yeah. a little tougher than some others that is good for the playoffs, but it's also makes you a little more injury prone, especially blocking all those shots. Um, but again, I think the Grizzly debate is something we're going to probably touch on a lot over the next couple weeks. I almost said months, but the playoffs are playoffs are like, a month close. Away. <laughs> it's yep. crazy. Um, but I mean, I, I, again, the Grizzly stuff is interesting because I do think he provides you something that the others don't, uh, the other ones who are, you know, getting slotted in a lineup, but they also provide something that the others don't. We've talked about this. Like, you know, Clifton is kind of a little all over the place and Forbert is great, you know, defensive shutdown defenseman, blocking shots, penalty killing, and Grizzly is better with moving the puck. I still think it comes down to matchups. I still think matchups is the biggest thing, but I think what breaks through that, those any matchups they have, probably Orloff and McAvoy is the top pair. Um, that yeah. seems to be what's working. It's worked so far. Um, but I mean, again, I like it's worked. And I think you have a legit top four now. And I, I know there were Bruins fans and some media uh, clamoring that, oh, they, you know, they don't have a top uh, set top four, uh, even without Orloff. But now, I mean, Orloff, McAvoy, Lindholm, Carlo. That's a <laughs> pretty damn good top four. Pretty good. Um, the big thing is you have to keep Carlo healthy. And you have to make sure that he returns to 2019 playoff form, uh, which is a kind of a big ask, I guess. Um, 
<laughs> in the playoffs because that was peak Brandon Carlo. But uh, we'll see what ends up happening uh, with that. But I will say this, Connor. If any of those players, Carlo, Forbert, Grizzlick, Clifton, they want to make sure they're in the lineup every night. They might want to go check out our good friends over at Hello Fresh. Powering up with protein is easier than ever with HelloFresh. Just check for the protein smart tag on their menu to quickly find recipes featuring 30 grams or more of protein. So again, bulking up with lots of protein, like one pot pork and black bean chili or creamy Dijon dill chicken. And guess what? HelloFresh makes it easy to eat what you love. You love what you, Connor Ryan, and you listeners love most. Customize select meals by swapping proteins or sides or even adding protein to a veggie dish. And now you can even add organic chicken or organic ground beef on select meals. Now, as you guys know, I have my favorite, the yogurt marinated chicken with garlic sauce. It's amazing. I love it. Again, I've turned into a chef. I've turned into a chef. They've got me being a chef now. Humble brag. Humble brag, brag. which I never thought would happen, but they made it so easy, and I'm so appreciative to HelloFresh for doing that, and they can do it to you, too. You want to get on the action? I don't blame you. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Bruin60 and use code Bruin60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Again, HelloFresh.com slash Bruin60 and use code Bruin60 for 60% off plus the elite, the elite free shipping. Again, HelloFresh. America's number one meal kit. So Tyler Bertuzzi, interesting case. First game against the Rangers. How about a stage for a first game? Matinee, ESPN, ABC uh, game against um, the Rangers on the third line with Charlie Coyle. Assists on a goal. And the Bertuzzi thing is interesting because that's a guy who was the top line left winger for the Red Wings. Now, again, I'm not, again, the Red Wings are not the Bruins, but still that's a top line left wing in the NHL. And he is on the third line for you. Um, and it's interesting again, now with Taylor Hall out, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, Bertuzzi brings a lot of options and I would almost argue is more, well, I think it, it's not even really debatable. It's way more of a third line player than Taylor Hall, just his style and the way he plays again, Taylor Hall was going good on that third line worked fine with coil. They made it work. Um, but Bertuzzi offers a little something different. And seem to be showing that on on uh, Saturday against the Rangers. And I think we'll be showing that a lot more um, in the coming weeks. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think he's been a, a solid fit through one game. And I think what Bertuzzi brings, as you said, it's not just uh, the pure goal scoring. I think I think you, you'll obviously take that. There's a guy who scored 30 goals last year. And if he's in your bottom six, pretty good. You know, <laughs> and who, who knows where eventually he falls. You know, Zaka, Krejci, and Paso not have been good. He could be a top six guy there. Um but I think he watched it in that game against the Rangers, whether it's his poise with the puck, um, really patient with it, you know, creative in the offensive zones, kind of weaving through the Rangers, uh, you know, defensive structure, looking for kind of those weak points in and around grade A ice, um, has a track record of really kind of planting himself in and around the, in and around the crease, uh, looking for chances. So a guy whose play style caters towards those high danger chances and quality looks on whatever line he's at. Again, it's kind of like, you look at Jake DeBrusque and how he plays a game and you look at just like every shift where he usually is, and you can see why that guy has 25, 30 goals a season, or at least DeBrusque is on that pace this year. Uh, but he's kind of the same player. Um, it's really dangerous in and around the ice. You saw, had that great pass to set up Charlie Coyle um, for that first goal of the game. And then you add in the other thing too, it'd be one thing if this was just a, another 20, 25 goal scorer, you know, the Bruins could have gone, got a, a Mike Hoffman, you know, this empty calorie scorer that, you know, has deficiencies down the other end of the ice. But you look at calorie score. Yeah, that's, that's a is. terrific, that's a terrific way to describe someone. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's almost like Max Domi, like the Bruins could have gone out and got a guy like Max Domi who was having a really good year, but you look at the deficiencies down the other end of the ice. How much is it worth? And it's not to say that Bertuzzi's a, a Selkie candidate or what have you, but he's responsible in his own end. Uh, always kind of hustles out there on every shift. And, as an extra element of just being a pain in the ass to play for. Like you look at just what the Bruins uh, acquired through these various trades. Yes. You look at Orlov ability to eat up minutes. Um, great. You know, transition, obviously offensively has been good at the way. I think is a really underrated scoring fourth line, uh, you know, player on the checking line and Bertuzzi is a former 30 goal scorer. 
but also pains in the asses. Like, yeah, you get. Uh, I think it was uh, Ty Anderson uh, said it before that you know what the Bruins need is a couple of shitheads. And I can see it. Like that's the exact thing you need is in the playoffs. They did. Like that they could have used to... one of those shitheads in the 2019 Cup final. Yeah, like again, that has to be what you know. There's no enforcers or goons or anything like that anymore. It's guys like half the way that will drive you crazy and then also can pot a couple of goals against you over a seven game series. I mean, Marchand yeah. obviously is more of an elite scoring winger, but still, you know, yeah, give so, you a little bit of a shithead sometimes. <laughs> so again, to, to add those players that Phil needs, you know, perform well and again, have shown it on the score sheet over this very small sample size, very encouraging, but you add in that extra element of what they bring with that kind of sandpaper style of play. It's just another example of how the Bruins, I think, address so many needs off of off of these three trades. So it's impressive in terms of what kind of dynamic they added to an already very good roster. And those forward lines, I mean, even taking Hall and Felino out, right? They're going to most likely potentially be out the rest of the regular season. Um, but again, you look at those four lines, they all have an identity and they all kind of do something different, right? The first line is kind of do it all. Good in their own zone, good in the O zone, great in the cycle game. The second line basically trades chances and converts on more than they give up. Um, you know, the little edgy, but they can do it right. Third line is, you know, big puck possession line, tough to play against, you know, coil kind of solidifies that identity, but you add in Bertuzzi and Frederick or Taylor hall before like, and kind of, I think Bertuzzi even solidifies that a bit more with just how tough he is to play against. And the fourth line checking defensive, all those things you every it's hard to stop each night and they all have the capability to score. That's the biggest thing is that it's not, they are not like who there was a, some uh, goober uh, from St. Louis. I don't know who he, I forget his name. I don't know who he is, but he, he mentioned something about um, the Bruins being a one line team. I want to be like, dude, like, it was the last I think it was a Rangers team. fan. Wasn't it? Oh, was it Rangers? I, I don't know. I, I, I think it was like blue shirts, something or other. So okay. I, I probably just saw the blues. Never mind. But it, maybe it was a, yeah, maybe it was a Rangers guy. My, my apologies to the city of St. Louis. So much to protect over there. That's yeah, um, fine. <laughs> but I will say, I will say, it's like that guy in Pittsburgh that came at me a few years ago. Um, the funny guy. Excuse me, that was a stand. That was a stand-up comic legend. Legend in Pittsburgh, Evan. So <laughs> you fall into his crosshairs. You're lucky you made it out. You're lucky I, you still oh, podcast in this day. Oof. I think I could have absolutely roasted you. Oh, you could have so. put me in just whoop roast easy. Yep. Um, I yep. could have been dead uh watching my own death but um he was the, the person apparently from new york was saying how the bruins are one line team and it's like well have you not watched a bruins game in like two years i mean this is not a one line team this is very much a four line team uh, and on d there <laughs> basically they almost have four pairs that, that, that was that, that saying that this bruins team is a one line team is like saying you don't watch the fast and fierce because you don't like cause it's like you haven't been watching them lately like they're they're going to the moon <laughs> I think they went to Atlantis la- the last yeah, movie. Like, running out of places to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, you're not you're not following the same the same team anymore. Yes, the Bruins historically have been a one line team, and that has been their flaw. But a little bit different this year. It's an old narrative. It's a very old yes. narrative. It's like how and again, narr- it, it it takes time. We've seen this for years now. It takes time for narratives to kind of change. You know nationally right like you know the the whole idea of the big bad Bruins well they really weren't the big bad Bruins for you know a lot of the 2010s right and now they kind of are going back to that Bertuzzi and Hathaway and Marchand and Greer and you know whatever um and you see it even with like for a long time remember um the, the players would get pulled and they would always take the goalie they hated to face most and for like years it was Carey Price even after he won his MVP and wasn't as good there's was like oh Carey Price Carey Price it takes time to change the narrative so but yeah to, to think they're a one-line team I, I don't really don't see the merit in that. Uh, I don't think they're really a one line team. Um, but I mean, again, the Bruins are missing Taylor Hall, uh, which again, not great, not what you want, but you do have the depth now with the Bertuzzi trade. Now we're seeing how important that Bertuzzi trade was, because I do think if Taylor Hall did, uh, if that happened to Taylor Hall and they never went out and got Bertuzzi and let's say they just did nothing. I think you could sneak by, but you still, that third line is nowhere near as potent um, without Burr, without, without Taylor Hall. Are you there? I am. I am back. Did you just freeze? I don't know what, yeah. The, the, my wife, I cut out for a second. Okay. You, I'm you back. froze in the funniest little, like, <laughs> I, meant I, I hated, it, I hated your it. take. I hated your take so much <laughs> that I just had to. 
All right, I, I am back though. Yeah. Okay. Really I'll tell. Like I'm the gonna, Wi-Fi is like. I'm gonna note that back. Uh, um, Connor lagged at one point because I also need to know that for the audio. Okay. And there's a lot. Like I'll be able to tell easily with the audio. Okay. Um. Okay. So I'll just. Did you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I hear. Do you see? Okay. Am I lagging still? Or no, no, no. You're fine. But did you hear what I said about Taylor Hall? About essentially, it, it lagged out at one point, but essentially, that why Bertuzzi is important to have here, or was there another part on top of that? So uh, no, that there. no, because I said like if they didn't have Bertuzzi, they would be oh yeah, kind of hold, oh, hold yeah. on it. So you can just do a three, two, one, and just start talking about that. Okay. All right. Three, two, one. Yeah, I think when you look at the Bruins and where uh, you miss a guy like Taylor Hall, and again, he hasn't maybe been the the same player we're used to seeing from him, at least early on in this year. You wonder if he's been dealing with a nagging injury for a while now because some of that trademark speed and playmaking hasn't really been there the last uh, couple of of weeks, if not a month, um, before he went down with that injury. So I think for the Bruins, yeah, it's again another – um, kudos to Don Sweeney and the Bruins for you know pivoting right away and getting a guy. It'd be one thing if you find out right before the deadline you don't have a guy like Taylor Hall, former hot winner, and go, all right, we got to get Nick Benino. Former what Nick winner? Dad. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, Evan <clears throat> Hart. Uh, it'd be one thing if the Bruins were like, all right, well, we got to pivot uh, Nick Bukestad. Like, look at <laughs> Nick Bukestad's a pretty solid player. And if he's like your third, fourth line pickup, if you're a team looking to to add a little bit, He's had a good year. He's a solid player. But just then go out and get a guy like Bertuzzi, who's a former 30 goal scorer, who, um, again, as you said, was a top line player for Detroit, would be a top six player for, I think, most teams in the NHL. Um, it's impressive. Like, I don't think you can replicate what Hall brings when he's on his game in terms of his straight line speed and how much of a mismatch that is uh, on the third line next to a guy like Charlie Coyle. But again, we don't know for sure what the timeline is for Taylor Hall or Nick Foligno. It remains to be seen if we're going to see them in the playoffs or not. But if they are, yikes, that is a very scary third line. And again, and if, if unfortunately the injury bug uh, does bite the Bruins and you don't have a uh, Hall of Mino, again, it's a sizable loss, but you at least have another potent guy who probably shouldn't be on the third line in Bertuzzi. They're driving play next to a, a guy like Coyle. So again, wouldn't say it's a win-win, but, you at least have added insurance by having a guy like Bertuzzi, a very, very strong player in that spot. And also credit to Trent Frederick for living mm-hmm. up to being a third line player this year, which I think um, has been so important. Um, you wrote a thing recently, wrote a thing, <laughs> just a quick thing. I did. Uh, I do write, Evan. <laughs> sometimes we write. You wrote a column on Charlie Coyle and how, you know, uh, and you've kind of talked about this a lot this year, about how he is really completely changed into a defensive um weapon and the numbers are staggering i believe 32 percent offensive zone draws this year um has basically just become a defensive you know guy that he that montgomery can rely on um and has kind of changed his role on the team but it's it's worked out quite well yeah it's been huge i think you look at charlie Coyle, and this is a guy that I think over the years, he's always the guy that gets drawn into, you know, trade rumors or moving that contract, which again, I think when you look at just the market value is a pretty fair deal to the one he signed. Um, you have guys who are far less effective in what he does that makes $5 million plus uh, in terms of what they bring and what Coyle's doing, especially this year. So Flyers probably have a bunch of those guys. <laughs> yeah, quite a few. Look at Vancouver. Vancouver's already over the cap, Evan, for next year, and they've not done anything. <laughs> oh, already over the cap. <laughs> They're horrible. <Disaster. laughs> but uh, I think you look at Coyle and what he brings, yes, maybe he doesn't have the same stat line as other guys that you could say are maybe more secondary players like Azaka or what have you, but what Coyle's doing in terms of being a guy that has only 32% of his faceoffs in the uh, in the offensive zone during five and five play. Last time I looked, that was 299th out of 316 NHL forwards. And of course, all the guys below him are fourth line grinders. It's half yes. away. It's all these guys that are, you know, dealt with a lot more uh, tougher ice to start with. So Coyle's being deployed primarily as a defensive forward this year. Um, and that also includes the PK. He's tied with Nosek for the most shorthanded time on ice amongst Bruins forwards. And despite all that time, the Bruins are still outscoring teams. I think it was 40 to 26 during Coyle's 5-5 five five ice time. Like, 
yeah, it's not like it's a situation where he's kind of being fed to the wolves and by kind of taking a hit on his stats, it's allowing uh, Bergeron and Krejci and these guys to get more favorable ice time. That has happened. Like they are getting a lot more offensive zone time, which is great for them. But Coyle is still tilting the ice in the Bruins' favor when they're out there. And again, it's the stuff we've seen from Coyle in the past, whether it's holding on to the puck, out muscling guys. Like it's he's a guy that even if he's starting in the D zone and you're trying to get the puck away from him, it's pretty tough. It's frustrating. It drains <laughs> you. Like it's something that again, he's a guy where his impact in the game doesn't always translate into goals, assists, what have you. Um, but for what he's been asked to do this year in terms of the greater scheme of things, I don't think it should be overlooked in terms of what that domino effect has been in terms of how it's impacted the rest of this team. It's crazy. A 6'3", 220-pound center. Not fun. Take the puck Shocking. Uh, yes. Still has 35 points. So, yes. again, like... Yeah, he's still, it's not like he's like... Is a, also a producing. point guy, yes. <laughs> So uh, it's clearly worked out well, just like you working out so well over at Boston.com, giving the people what they want. Connor, what can people look forward to from you uh, over the next couple weeks, months, yeah. years? Wow. Yeah, so years. we'll have you covered, uh, again, every step of the way this Bruins season with recaps, columns, breakdowns, features, all that good stuff over at Boston.com. Of course, we have you covered on everything that's happening in Boston sports, whether it's Patriots, Red Sox, Celtics, everything. So please read uh, my stuff and all the rest of our great staff stuff over at boston.com daily, please. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can at Connor Ryan underscore 93. Go do all that. And remember to also go subscribe to New England Hockey Journal. Busy time of year. Lots of fun stuff over there. Anyways, that's this week's Burns Beat. I'm Evan Marinovsky. Burns Beat listeners have a great rest of your week.